I'm so glad to see everyone this evening. As most of you probably know, uh, Shelley, who usually leads this uh, practice period, is on um, retreat for the next five weeks or so uh, and is taking some time for personal retreat, um, leading other retreats. So there's going to be a rotating cast of characters until Shelley returns in, in August. Um, is anyone new here this evening? And if so, could you just unmute yourself and say hello? Great to see everyone here um, this evening. And I just like to begin by saying that I'm uh, speaking from my home, which is very close to where common ground is. And this is really on sacred Dakota land. And um, the land in Minneapolis, particularly um, southeastern Minneapolis, is um, among the most sacred places in um, the Dakota world. And at the confluence of the Mississippi and the Minnesota, that's the Bedote, which is kind of the original creation place. So, um, so this is really sacred, unceded land that is still not only the ancestral, but still the, um, the living homeland of the, uh, of the Dakota. And so I just want to acknowledge um, that that's where, where I am tonight and, um, and just have that sense of wanting to respect the sacredness of, of this land and live, live ethically on it and live in, in reparation on it. Um, so we'll begin with um, a sit. And what I'd like to do as we begin is just invite you to bring your whole self into our session uh, this evening. All the parts of you, um, the parts that were irritated and impatient today, the parts that um, don't seem very meditative or contemplative, um, the parts that um, we, at least I, sometimes have a tendency to, uh, to stuff away when I'm, I'm coming to be in a more meditative state. And just to know that, that everything is welcome here. All of our neuroses and our uh, unproductive habits and maybe our overproductive habits that everything is really welcome here so that we sit with our whole selves, the whole body, the whole mind. And I'll ring the bell just once to start and once at the end and do just a little gentle guiding. So just allow yourself to have a posture that truly supports you, that enables you to feel that you are here just exactly as you are. Alert, but not tense. And sometimes in meditation practice, we enter with a sense of striving, a sense of a goal, something to be achieved. There's often a lot of judging around a formal sitting practice, a sense of rating ourselves, giving ourselves a score. 
And let's just see if we can tonight let go of that. Let go of the striving. And just let our mindfulness be a receptive awareness. In mindfulness, we remember to be aware of the present moment's experience. And awareness is always possible, but it takes no more effort than just watching the clouds move across the sky or sitting by a lake shore and watching the ripples on the lake. We have that same kind of kindly interest, just open and aware. And as Mary Oliver says, whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. So we sit together here tonight in this awareness, welcomed by the world. We sit in community, getting support from and giving support to each other just by our simple receptive awareness and our kindly intention.
So Shelley often invites people to stretch a little bit or to move, whatever will help you make the transition from sitting pretty still to engaging in a different sort of way. And is there anyone who joined us during the sit who is new here for the first time and just would like to say hello, um, your name, your pronouns, introduce yourself at all? Well, thanks everybody for being here. And my plan for tonight is I'd like to engage us in a discussion. I'm going to speak for a while, but I'm really interested in our investigating the idea of belonging and why is that so hard so uh, Ruth King who is a wonderful Dharma practitioner um, trainer brilliant person and she's the author of um, mindful of race. When she does trainings, and I've done this with her a few times, whether you're in an auditorium or in a Dharma hall, she suggests that people pair up. And then this is what she offers. I am only here because you are here. You are only here because I am here. Our hearts are old friends. I am only here because you are here. You are only here because I am here. Our hearts are old friends. And I just like us to take a minute to lean into that and imagine what it would be like to really believe that, to let go of our sort of suspend that critical, cynical self and really imagine what it would be like if we lived this way, if we felt this sort of you are here because I am here. And I am here because you are here. Our hearts are old friends. It's a, the first time I did this, um, and I turned to a stranger in a, a large auditorium. And uh, I was, it, it was a kind of shocking uh, meditation. And it's a very beautiful idea. What if we were to, to somehow get this sort of connection that we all, all have? And if we were able to lean into this idea that our hearts are old friends and each one of us really invites the presence of the other, that we are deeply connected in this way. And the longing to belong is so fundamental. And ironically, we often conclude on very little evidence, I think, that we don't belong. So we have this basic fundamental longing to belong. And you can think of um, instances probably within the past week or two weeks when you were someplace and you just felt you didn't belong, you were not, not connected. I think our defensive self-protective instincts often take over. That instead of acknowledging our longing to belong, we become really defensive, um, protect ourselves. Protect ourselves from what is, is an interesting question. Uh, 
it's sometimes said that you know, we think that when we're in a, a crisis, we're going to rise and become our best selves to act in the noblest sort of way. But the data suggests that what actually happens is that we sink down to our basic training. So our basic training, it's really important that we get that right, that we get our default mode right. So if our default mode is you know, being defensive and uh, protective, um, that may have some utility in some circumstances, but it's, it's not a default mode that's going to help us bring about a better world for ourselves and for others. And uh, I think sometimes, particularly in Buddhist practice, um, we use our spiritual practice to withdraw and draw apart from belonging. Um, and, uh, and in that way, we, we draw away from healing ourselves and the world. I think I, it has seemed to me over my many years of practice that there is a kind of, of tendency sometimes because there's so much of you know, the Buddha goes under the tree, sits in solitude. And I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to minimize the importance of, of solitude sometimes and being able to withdraw. But when that becomes our default mode always that we just withdraw into, <clears throat> pardon me, into solitude, it doesn't seem to me that that's what um, our world needs right now, what our, um, our country needs, and depending on where you are, what your city needs. And I think, <clears throat> again, this is a particularly Buddhist move, is to say that we're practicing non-attachment when I think we're actually justifying disengagement and separation. So just think for a minute if that rings true for you that, <clears throat> that we tell ourselves that we're practicing non-attachment, but what we're really practicing is, is this sort of, of disengagement and separation. And, and I've been thinking about this idea about belonging for, for months now. And um, one of the things that, that is just kind of interesting is just the word belonging, that we think of belongings, plural, as um, sort of the materials that we own and, and schlep around. And uh, interestingly, I think we're often deeply ambivalent about our our belongings, um, ambivalent about our relationship to the objects that we possess, um, and sometimes say that uh, you know the things that we own own us, and we you know want you know, sort of have this ideal of a totally decluttered, minimalist, monastic simplicity, and that's kind of a trope. You know, we see this over and over again. Oh, I've got too much stuff. I got to get rid of it. You know, if only I could live, live really simply. Um, I remember feeling just, um, what was it that I saw? It was a couple of years ago. A very expensive BMW station wagon that had the license plate S-I-M-P-L. And I thought, really? Really, what a vanity plate. Um, so I'd also just invite us, and this is just kind of an open, open-ended inquiry, to notice all the judgment, all the suffering, um, not in the objects themselves, but in what we think our relationship to them should be. 
you know, there's no harm in having stuff and even a lot of stuff. But what has really interested me is how often I'm in conversations with people and it's all about getting rid of stuff or decluttering. I mean, there's all this judgment, all this suffering around objects, which are you know, pretty, pretty inert, but we have these ideas about what our relationship to these objects should be. And there's a lot of judgment and a lot of suffering. Um, and I think it, it goes along with our sort of um, fantasy in a way of uh, having a sort of super simple, um, perhaps minimalist life. This is kind of uh, monasticism, <clears throat> urban monasticism um, in a way. And I think, I, I think this is purely speculative. But as I've been kind of um, just noodling around with this idea now for a couple of months, um, I think that that um, sort of our relationship to our belongings and this whole idea of belongings as baggage in a way, I'm suspecting that it somehow has this little carryover of taint to the notion of belonging as relationship. I mean, I don't know if you ever, if any of it's a, an old song from the early part of the 20th century. Um, and the, the, frame, the refrain was, you belong to me. And it was about, um, you know, eat an apple every day, be to bed by three, take good care of yourself, you belong to me. And I mean, this, this idea that we've also had a kind of um, popular culture, popular song that in this notion of belonging as being, um, I mean, I think oppressive in a way, but it's like one is a possession of another, belonging in, in that way. So can we, be, because I think, and again, um, kind of what I've been, been noodling about, um, you know, that we fundamentally have this deep desire to belong, to be connected. So can we think about belonging in terms of um, non-separation? And this I think is really what Mary Oliver was getting at in the uh, piece of the, the end of the poem, Wild Geese that I read when we started our meditation, where she says, whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination over and over, announcing your place. I'm sorry, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. I mean, a great notion of this sort of connectedness of, of non separation your place in the family of things, your place in, in all of creation and the world offers itself to your imagination that each one of us has a place in this world, a place that we, we belong in this place and it all belongs to us. The world offers itself to your imagination. So how can we see come to see ourselves having a place in the family of things? How can we develop as a practice this notion of belonging, the sort of thing that Ruth King talks about when we, we announce that I'm here because you're here. You're here because I'm here. Our hearts are old friends. There's... Um, a wonderful writer and activist named Valerie Cower, who is a Sikh. And um, she's written um, a book called See No Stranger, which she said is one of the tenets of the Sikh religion. See no stranger. And she says, <clears throat> when 
whenever you meet a person, recognize you are a part, part of me that I do not yet know. That that's how we approach the stranger. You are a part of me that I do not yet know. And she said, we practice orienting to the world with a sense of wonder, <clears throat> preparing for the possibility of connection. I mean, what a practice. Orienting ourselves to the world with a sense of wonder, preparing for the possibility of connection. It's a beautiful, beautiful aspiration. Um, in addition to Ruth King, who has been just one of my big Dharma uh, heroines, um, the other person that I think about so highly is Joanna Macy, who is now 92, and she is um, a Buddhist scholar, um, philosopher, translator of Rilke, and um, an eco. Um, she really started uh, some of the eco philosophy and uh, eco dharma. And she talks about us all now at this time being part of a great turning, that here we are kind of on the, on the cusp. And we're, we're really getting a sense of, of how things are shifting and changing, you know, with the, um, we just look around and we see the, the fires and the heat dome and we see all of these sorts of things. And there is this great kind of turning. And in addition to all of the um, sort of natural disasters, what we see also is this tremendous, um, surge of, of persons, many of them young persons, who are just so committed to, um, to doing what they can to preserve and sustain life on earth and to make it the best life possible. And so it's been very, very inspiring. And she talks about all of us being in this great turning, like the turning of the wheel of the Dharma. And um, and we do it by connecting. We do it by recognizing the good. Sometimes she talks about the great ball of merit. And she says, if you think about every human being who's ever lived, they did at least one not bad thing in their lives. And so there is this great ball of merit from all these people. Maybe they in inadvertently did something that was not bad. But she said, you know, we need to think about our ancestors and the good, and we carry this good, good forward. We think imaginatively, we, we don't see ourselves as separate and, and struggling, but we see ourselves as this kind of um, lineage and we come together and we come together to, um, to really support and sustain life on earth in the most, um, intelligent way that we can. And so I want to read a poem that um, she wrote that I have read before that, that just completely inspires me. She says, when you act on behalf of something greater than yourself, you begin to feel it acting through you with a power that is greater than your own. This is grace. Today, as we take risks for the sake of something greater than our separate individual lives, we are feeling graced by other beings and by earth itself. Those with whom and on whose behalf we act give us strength and eloquence and staying power we didn't know we had. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other in the web of life. Our true power comes as a gift like grace because in truth it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, 
we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. I'm gonna read that last stanza again. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. I just get chills when I read that because that is my aspiration to work with others, to feel that sense of belonging and to feel that sense of, of purpose and to trust, to trust that in any situation, if we trust each other and draw on each other's strengths, that the courage and the intelligence in any situation will be there for us. So what I would love to hear are, um, are your reflections, your experience of belonging, your experience of non-separation, non-exclusion, and any other ideas that you might have. So please just um, unmute yourselves and, uh, and chime in. So were you able to take care of yourself? I mean, that, that's also in, in this idea of, of belonging. It's, it's not about sacrificing oneself. It really is, you know, that we care for ourselves and we protect ourselves appropriately that we, we don't do things that would be foolhardy and we we often need to just trust our own our own instincts but were you were you able to to take care of yourself in that situation i, I don't know if you if you have a, a meta practice but um i sometimes in in difficult situations just have the aspiration may you be free from harm and and just sending that out to both of the, the people involved in this, may you be free from harm. Um, may no inner or may no inner or outer harm come to you. And that's just an aspiration that we can have for people, even for people who are behaving in, in dangerous ways. We can still hope that they are not harmed and that um, that may be, um, that may be a, a response. Uh, but thank you for sharing that, Alan. And I, you know, it's, uh, as I, I said, you know, this sort of ideas that we have um, in difficult times, we get, we get to see what our, what our default is, is going to be. So thank you. You know, this, it, it is really um, a practice and there are probably for most of us places and communities like physical places and communities that we do feel more at home that we feel uh, freer to express who we are um, probably because we feel that we can be seen in um, in a way that that makes sense for us. Um, and I, I think um, the practice that um, Valerie Cower talks about, you know, see no stranger, uh, it's partly me, you may never feel so at ease in, in Fargo. You may be able to find um, kind of your people, you may be able to find, um, you know, folks that are, um, that share some of your experiences and and your views, um, but it's it's not. I don't think this is about feeling um, like that. That every place feels like home. Although I think there are some people, genuinely, who are um, <coughs> so um, completely. Um, at home in their own skins that they can go lots of places and feel at home. I, I've had that sense, for example, 
from the Dalai Lama. And I've met a couple of other, other people and they just seem to be so at ease with themselves that kind of no matter where they are, they're sort of at ease in the world. And, and it, it's, um, I think it's kind of a, a rare quality. Um, but this idea about seeing no stranger, that instead of maybe um, like feeling that you need to, to pull away, you might be able to, um, to just decide what's appropriate to share in the community and with other people and not. And, um, and just take as um, a possibility that everyone we meet has something to teach us. And sometimes it may be teaching us negatively, like, I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna go to that place. I see, I see where that leads to. But that we, we don't um, shut them out. And I think that's, that's the real practice of not shutting other people out and of um, trying to imagine um, what, I mean, this is, a, uh, what does it mean that there you are in Fargo and you're only there because someone else is there in Fargo? What would that mean? And just explore that as an idea, not as a, I'm not giving you practical advice here, but just for your own imagination, what would it mean to, um, to believe that your heart is an old friend of the people you meet who are very unlike yourself? And uh, just having that, that sense of kind of tenderness toward our common humanity, which I think is, is something that we try to, um, to cultivate. Um, so I... I wish you luck in, in, your, in your endeavors there. And I hope you do find people where you would have that more visceral sense of belonging. But, but partly my, my talk tonight was about how often our immediate, we, we kind of have this immediate sense of let's withdraw, let's pull back. Um, you know, there, there is no commonality. And I think what, what I've been trying to investigate is the possibility of commonality. And I'm still in that investigation place. Years ago, um, I was a philosophy professor. And um, when I was uh, early on in my teaching, one of my students came up to me and said, I can really tell whenever you're feeling really insecure. He said, your vocabulary, you just start pulling out all the really big words. And I thought, how perceptive, mm. how perceptive the, the defense of, um, you know, sort of moving into that more scholarly, academic, you know, and, and very, very clear. Yeah, I was really feeling vulnerable and being, uh, that was uh, a kind of, of defense. And how, uh, what a relief it is when we can be vulnerable with each other and, and trust I think that that's the other challenging part of it, that in this space, there's often a sense of, of trust that we see each other uh, fairly regularly and uh, have that. Um, and, and also our practice, that our, our practice is a practice of compassion. So coming into a space where, um, one believes that you know we're all motivated by compassion that that's a value we all share it makes it um, it makes it easier to be vulnerable and to have a sense of, of belonging like we all belong we all all share the the value of compassion because in a, a 12 step group everyone belongs i mean that's the there there's no uh there's no bar to get over. You know, everyone belongs. If you're there, you belong.
and uh, and that supports a kind of intimacy and and trust where people can uh, can really share what is very very uh, important uh, you know, sort of life saving important in a way. Thank you, Laura. That sounds really skillful. I mean, you know, a detachment as as skillful means rather than detachment as avoidance. And there's something that's that's really really different in that. And uh, and some, it's been my experience that sometimes in, in practice people use detachment as a way of avoiding. But what you were saying, Laura, sounded very skillful a very intentional um, detachment with with love and and not just cutting someone off or just completely hunkering down thanks thanks for that contribution what you what you said and it is that real idea that that mary oliver talks you know that the world the world offers itself to your imagination and um you know you have your place in the family of things. So feel, feel welcomed. The world offers itself to your imagination. Being tender toward ourselves is, uh, is a really worthy project to see if we can cultivate a kind of tenderness toward our own hearts. You know, so often we can extend that to um, to another person or to an animal, um, to a child, we can, we can be very, very tender and we um, neglect cultivating tenderness toward our own, our own hearts, toward our own, own being. So that's a, that's a good thing to, to remember when we talk about compassion. Can we be tender? compassionate um, toward ourselves. So we are just about at the end of our time. Is there anything anyone else would like to say before we, we close? Well, I've, it's been um, very grateful to you all for being here this evening and um, sharing um, in such a an honest, intimate, intimate way. So I really appreciate that. So let's share the merit. Um, oh, my favorite act of imaginative generosity. You can just do this till the cows come home. You know, this is this is um, such a such a great practice. So if there's any goodness to our practice any benefit or blessing or merit, we would, if we could, gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, our communities, to the people we like and the people we don't like, to the people we know and the many, many, many people we do not yet know. And in addition to the two-legged, we would share these blessings with the four-legged, the many-legged, the winged, the scaly, the slithery, the finny. May all beings everywhere find a path of peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So thank you all and good night. Take care. <laughs>